all things to all men. Okay. Um, right, so I want to talk about um, quantum algorithms for uh, a class of problems that I'm going to call uh, finding hidden symmetries. Um, and uh, all the good stuff you're going to see today uh, is joint work with Chris. And to reinforce that, uh, he's going to give the last half of the talk. Uh, so as before, uh, just around the time I put you to sleep, Chris is going to be here to, to wake you up and deliver all the good stuff. Um, OK, so what have you got in store for you here? So I'll mostly by example, um, and then maybe a little more formally, tell you the problem I'm interested in thinking about. And then, uh, because uh, even in this luxurious three-hour block that they've promised us here this morning, um, four-hour block, uh, time is tight, I'm going to develop a really uh, sort of uh, stripped-down model of quantum computing. We'll call it the poor man's model, which I think is kind of funny because I don't think there really is a poor man's model of quantum computing. Um, but uh, so then we'll talk about that. Then I'll say a little bit about uh, group representations. And then finally, uh, Chris is going to give you the big slam dunk at the end and talk about what I will mysteriously call an obstruction. OK, so what's the problem? You can all see over here, right? So what's the problem? Uh, the problem is what I'm calling the hidden symmetry problem. And instead of telling you what it is, I'm just going to give you two examples. And so the first is the problem of uh, order finding. And in the order finding problem, uh, we are given a big number n, which you can think of as, let's say, the product of two primes, and a number x. And given those, the problem is to determine the smallest t, so that x to the t is congruent to 1, not n. And um, this is a nice number theoretic problem all by itself. It's also interesting because if you can solve order finding, then it turns out you can factor n, um, which is um, uh, simple but, but neat all the same. So it turns out that if you pick a random x and you compute its order uh, with good probability, its order is even. And then you can look at what happens if you take x to the power of its order over 2, and then with good probability, you found a non-trivial square root of minus 1. And you know what those look like. Since they're non-trivial, they're sort of 1 mod 1 of these guys and minus 1 mod the other. And then you can use that with the GCD to recover the factors. Um, OK, so that's the first example. And the second example um, is the problem of finding the set of automorphisms of a, uh, of a graph. So this is the graph automorphism problem. And in this case, I give you a graph, G. And the problem is to, I'll be a little vague here, and say compute the group of all automorphisms of G. That's the collection of all permutations pi, so that pi G is G. Okay. Um, of course, often when we talk about this in a complexity theoretic world, we think of the problem of just figuring out if this is non-trivial. OK, great. Um, so I'd like to wrap these two problems up into a slightly uh, more general framework. And the framework is the following. Uh, let's call this the hidden symmetry problem. And how does this problem work? Well, I give you a, 
uh, function from a group into some set S, and I ask you to uh, determine for me the set of symmetries of this function, and that's the collection of all group elements G, oops, so that for any x, f of x is f of, oh, maybe I'll write it here, g of x. Great. And um, since I haven't told you exactly what the input or the output of this problem is or you know, how you're going to express this to me, let's uh, continue for a moment at this kind of vague level. And let's just observe how these two problems fit into this hidden symmetry problem um, for order finding. You can consider the function f that takes t into x to the t mod n. And uh, to really be honest, I guess this is a function from z into, well, we'll call it z mod n. And then it's easy to check that, indeed, the set of symmetries of this function are exactly the collection of exponents so that, um, so that x to the s equals 1. Symmetries of this are exactly all s, so that x to the s is congruent to 1. Not n. And for the graph automorphism problem, uh, this is even more direct. So here you can think of the function that takes a permutation pi to its action on a graph, and then you can check that the symmetries of this, if you do things on the right side, is exactly the automorphism for G. Okay, great. So, um, I guess we have lots of luxurious board space, but maybe I'll be a little miserly here. So, let's uh, see what we can say about the complexity of this problem. And uh, to you know, put that on precise footing, uh, I need to tell you what the model of computation here is. And so since we're all between friends, I'm going to give you a really generous model of computation, which is you can have as much computing as you want. The only thing I'm going to charge you for is querying the function f. So we're just interested in query complexity. Right? So you can have as much computation as you want. Um, unfortunately, the only way that you're allowed to interact with the function f is um, you can ask its value at a particular group element. And every time you do that, I charge you a dollar. And so the game in general is given Oracle access to this function. You know, how many, uh, how many queries does it take to reconstruct this, uh, this set of symmetries? Now, in fact, um, both of the problems that I describe here are easier than this problem because both of the problems I described here have the property that in some sense F exactly captures the symmetry of a subgroup. So um, here we're going to focus on an even easier version, which we'll call the hidden subgroup problem. And in this version, uh, f has an extra promise. So there exists a subgroup h of g so that f of x equals f of y, if and only if uh, x equals hy for some h in h. Okay. Same problem. We have this extra, pro uh, extra promise. And the promise is really now there's a subgroup so that f is, um, uh, f is in fact, exactly constant and distinct on the different um, I guess, left cosets of the, of the subgroup. Um, OK. So having said all that, uh, I can give you the, the bad news, which is that um, classically, the uh, complexity of this problem is um, what I'd call hopeless. So 
uh, it's easy to engineer. It's easy to engineer versions of this problem where the uh, number of samples that you need, or the number of queries that you need to make, is um, square root g. Good. So, <laughs> good. So, you know, how do we calibrate our complexity here? So, for the, uh, so at least for the two problems that I described here, what we would really like are algorithms that use a number of samples that is uh, polynomial and log the size of the group. So, you know, this is the yardstick by which we're going to um, measure our complexity. And so, uh, in, in this context at least, an algorithm like this is an exponential time. And probably, not probably, you know, the single most uh, interesting and important quantum algorithmic discovery ever is that when the group is abelian, quantum algorithms can magically solve this problem. Um, so the interesting Still fact. Not. Uh, yes, although, uh, did you just ask that? Sorry, I didn't see if yeah. his mouth moved. Um, Yes, although I'll be grateful if uh, later in the talk when I describe the model, you don't ask, <laughs> why is this something? I mean, um, yes, indeed, still in a query complexity model. Of course, once you're in a quantum model, you have to be precise about what you mean by a single query. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so you can engineer problems like this even that are abelian. In fact, I mean, um, if you take the group Z2 to the N, and then you think of hiding a subgroup that's generated by a single random element, right, then it turns out that you basically have this two to one function. And uh, if you choose a random element that's hidden, then your classical query algorithm, it just has to hunt around in F until it finds two values that, that it, you know, two locations that take the same value, and that will take it about the square root. And you can make that precise. Uh, do you have a question? OK, great. And so th you know, the really interesting uh, fact is that uh, for abelian g, there exist efficient quantum algorithms for this. And what does efficient mean? Efficient means order poly and log of g. And there's a number of samples, right? So we just count samples. Um, OK, great. So the next thing I'd like to do is tell you how these algorithms work, uh, roughly. And in order to do that, we need to agree on some kind of model of quantum computing. But I don't want to, time, I don't want to take the time to develop a real honest model of quantum computing. So we're going to talk about a kind of genie in the box model of quantum computing. And if anyone asks you where you learned about this, it wasn't from me. Okay? okay. So uh, here's how the model looks. Uh, this is the poor man's quantum model. Okay. And uh, so how does the poor man's quantum computer look? Well, over here. It's just a classical computer. And um, the poor man's quantum computer, unfortunately, is a quantum computer that has been stripped down so far that it really only knows how to do one kind of thing, which is deal with query complexity problems. Okay. And the classical computer, of course, is allowed to make queries to this uh, function f. Now, the classical computer also has this uh, sort of magical box. Let's think of it as like an urn here. And uh, this, uh, this box, the classical computer is allowed to interact with in exactly two ways. So um, it can wave a little magic wand over the box, in which case this box will be prepared with something that I'm going to call a coset state. I'll tell you exactly what that is. It's going to be a mathematic, it's going to be a vector in a vector space, simple object. So there are two things it can do. It can do what I will call prepare, in which case it just somehow um, uh, rubs the size of threads, rubs the size of the little urn containing the deep genie, and what prepares what 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 uh, emerges inside is a um, 
a certain vector that depends on f. And the other thing it can do is it can measure. And I'll tell you precisely what these mean. Okay? The measurement means it's going to pick a basis and it's going to carry out a certain kind of measurement. So what's the good thing about this model is that we can state it very, very simply. It's just a mathematical model. It's actually, um, I mean, it's a lie in the sense that it's neither stronger nor weaker than the, than the real model of quantum computing. It's uh, weaker because the way that it interacts with this function f is now extremely constrained to, to just pull out a certain kind of state from f. Um, it's much stronger because in this model, I'm actually going to let you measure according to an arbitrary basis, which is something you can't usually do in a quantum computer. Okay, so let me be a little more precise about how this model works. Um, okay, so to be a little more precise, I need just a little bit of notation. So if G is a group, let's use the notation CG to denote the vector space of all functions from G into C. And I'm going to take the liberty of writing this vector space in a bunch of different ways. So you could also, of course, write the vector space of all functions from G into C as the collection of all you know, linear combinations of functions that take the value 1 at one position and 0 everywhere else, the delta functions. And I'm also going to use the following notation for that, which is fg g. So in this context, you can think about this here as the function that takes the value 1 at g and 0 everywhere else. One thing I would like to say about this is that so there's. Yes, indeed, that's right. So you know, uh, for these expansions, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and the one thing I'd like to say right now about this space of functions is that uh, you can put a natural inner product on this space. So you can define an inner product, um, f of h, this is 1 over g, sum over all little g and g. Oops. Okay. And that gives a notion of length of the space. Um, okay, so having said that, uh, let me return now to how our poor man's quantum computer works. So in the poor man's quantum computer, the prepare operation does the following. It uh, prepares the urn here so that inside the urn is uh, the following state. It contains what I will call uh, this state. This is, I guess, with that inner product, I have a normalization that's something like g over h. Ignore that. Sum over all h and h of ch. Okay. So uh, the prepare operation. Um, uh, imbues the urn with memory of a one vector in this vector space, okay. a, a function from uh, g into c. And the vector that it remembers is the following vector. It is um, a vector which is um, magically um, a uh, uniform combination of all elements in some random left coset of the um, of the of the subgroup hidden by f. So you can think of this prepare operation as the one way that you can connect the function f with your urn. And to answer your and to not sorry to not answer your question from before, um, this operation magically costs only one query. Okay? It costs you one dollar. Well, okay, I mean, the way I have written it here, it involves this, it involves H here, 
And so, I'm sorry, I, sh I, I should have said F hides H, which of course is unknown to you, right? The name of the game here is to uncover H from F. So in this poor man's model, when you uh, carry out the prepare operation, by some procedure that I'm not going to make clear, but so it's, so but so it's so no big. Practically, I mean, you have an element C of G, and then this is the output of the you know, thing that you're using at quantum. Operate. Yeah, this is this is for a this is for a, a random C and G, and so every time you prepare a state, you get a state like this, but the C is going to be a different random draw every time. It takes a measurement. That's right. This operation already used the measurement. Okay, so Avi, Avi insists on being honest. Okay, so. It's not one sentence, but I think some people have seen it. Okay, so to be honest, what really happens is uh, you can prepare the state, which is the uniform superposition over the whole group. You then query F, right? Then you measure the register that you use to query F. And when you do that, um, you discover a particular value of f, and what's left over in the state, in the part of the state in which you originally prepared the uniform superposition over the whole group, is now um, exactly this state. And the c that you are stuck with is the one that corresponded to the particular value of f that you measured. This is a lot like a posterior distribution. If you start with the uniform distribution and you observe the value of f, then this is your posterior distribution. Absolutely. I mean, you can even think about. I mean, you know, you can even think about uh, this part of the algorithm in some sense as a. Well, that, yes, that's right. Why that's classic. Why oh, I don't know. I I think I. Yeah, didn't, I, I think I already introduced a one over g in my inner product. So okay. Uh oh. Okay. So you're in for a you're in for a rocky ride later in the talk, gentlemen. All right. Um, uh, okay. So. So please ask a question if I've confused you here. I thought that this would make things simpler, but you know, maybe being dishonest was not such a great uh, strategy. Yeah. Sorry, but do I know C? Sorry? No. no. You don't know C. But um, you get the value f of C in addition to this. That's true. Exterior. That's true. Is However, that value, that value is meaningless. Okay. Yeah. So I mean in the game we're playing here, you can you can imagine that an adversary, you know, an adversary chooses the S's that you see. Um, so while well, it is true that you, know, you get a different S for every coset, the S's are structureless. And in fact, you have to be a little careful about this when you define the problem. If you, often if you write down a defini definition of this in a careless way, you can let information about C leak into S, and that changes the game significantly. <laughs> okay, good. So, so yeah, in fact, um, when, I originally when I originally defined the uh, hidden symmetry problem, I permitted that possibility. Um, and in that, case, in that case, this is significantly more complicated. Right? This is, in fact, I mean, in that case, uh, you, you, you cannot produce these states in a generic way. In fact, in, in fact you can't produce them. I mean, you, um, you end up with actually some fiber states that depend on the inverse images of f. Um, okay, we're going to buy this. Um, okay, so you can you know rub the urn. The urn um, has to pay one dollar. It takes one query for f, and it produces this state. I want to remind you, although this has um, been said uh, already, that every time you prepare a state, you, um, you 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 get this object that clearly contains a huge amount of information about f, right? It's a state that is uniform on a left coset of f, uh, on a left coset of h. But each time you do it, the coset that you you get will be a random one. Okay, so that's preparation, um, and I think that can go. Is there a third board? And then how does measurement work?
measurement is the interesting part. So uh, once you have prepared this state, unfortunately, I don't let you look at it. Okay? It's, it's captive inside the little urn. There is, however, one way that you're allowed to extract information about the state, and that's by this process called measurement. And for measurement, um, you proceed as follows. The algorithm designer is allowed to select a basis of uh, his or her, her choice for CG. And this is the set, yeah. Yeah, this is a set. Um, so the algorithm designer is allowed to select uh, any basis, arbitrary complexity, uh, for this uh, space of all functions. And then the urn returns uh, a, a measurement. But uh, and what is that measurement? Uh, what is that measurement? It's just a probability distribution over these basis vectors that the algorithm designer chose. And it returns the basis vector b with a probability just equal to the norm squared of the projection of this um, hidden vector into b. So. so those are the rules. Sorry, say it again. Um, yes, yes, thanks. It needs to be an orthonormal basis. Yeah, I guess when I use Dirac notation, I may accidentally put a bar in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they are equivalent. Yeah, in fact, um, yeah, and here I mean that integral. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully, the, um, uh, hopefully the model is clear. Uh, the thing I like about the model is that it's now a perfectly mathematical model. You don't need to know anything about quantum mechanics to understand the model, right? You, um, you can prepare the state. Uh, it's just a vector in this vector space. And once you prepare the state, you're allowed to carry out uh, a measurement in a basis of your choice. Um, every time you do that, you're, um, you're given the result of a classical probability distribution, where you observe this uh, basis vector b with that probability. And um, I should say, when you carry out this measurement, that destroys the state forever. Okay? Now, you can keep playing the game. But your next step has to be to prepare a state again. Okay? So you can only, only get one measurement from the state. Yeah. Um, so uh, you could have several urns. Um, and exactly what the model is with several urns um, is then very important to how powerful it is. So if you have several independent urns, um, that is, if I just force you, if I restrict you to the same game with each urn, then of course there's no new power in the model, right? So you're asking a more sophisticated question, um, and um, actually one maybe that I can return to later, but so you're asking a more sophisticated question, which is what if I have a bunch of urns, and I can prepare these states, but then, you know, I'm allowed to select a basis for that whole tensor product of the spaces, and that actually makes us, that changes the model significantly. So um, we'll say a little bit about what happens in that multi-urn model. Okay. So, models okay? So, uh, the next question I want to talk about is, you know, what is the right basis to use here? So, let me just point out that this is a highly basis-dependent uh, operation, of course. And uh, one basis that we can immediately see does not work is uh, measuring in um, this basis. You just measure in the group basis, you always get, you always get um, the, you always get the uniform distribution, okay? So, because uh, you don't know what, what C is, um, you know, the posterior distribution here is just uniform all over the group, you learn nothing. So the question is, what's the right basis uh, in which to carry out these measurements? And to ramp up to that, um, I'd like to completely leave this picture behind and say a little bit about um, harmonic analysis. Um, yeah, we'll, I'll get to an example. Um, so I'd like to completely shift gears and talk a little bit about Fourier analysis. Um, 
So let's uh, focus our attention for the moment uh, on a group, G. And, uh, and let's consider the situation where we're trying to study a function f from a group G into the complexes. And at this level of generality, this is something that crops up everywhere in mathematics. Um, and our strategy is going to be to take f and to write f as a linear combination of a family of functions that, uh, that are actually distinguished by the group G. So why is this a good idea? When we're trying to understand the structural properties of a function f defined on a group, the group itself is not incidental to the problem, right? So if we're trying to do analysis, then we have the group of real numbers here, and we're trying to understand the structure of f with respect to you know, small uh, shifts in the real numbers around zero. We're trying to understand its differential structure, right? If we're trying to understand isoparametric inequalities on the hypercube, then we have a function uh, defined on z2 to the n, and then we're interested in the changes that we observe in f perturbed by a small particular basis for the group, right? So the, in, all these, in all of these cases, in, I mean, um, uh, you know, the examples are sort of endless. The group involved here is not incidental. It's, it's essential to the problem, right? So the group structure is really part of the problem, um, part of the statement of the problem. And so our strategy is going to be to write f in terms of some family of functions over which carrying out analysis with respect to g is exceptionally easy. Okay. And um, when, when the group is abelian, the first thing I want to say is that when the group is abelian, a kind of amazing thing happens. And you know, since we have all been, you know, since we were all taught these things uh, early in our mathematical careers, I think it's easy to forget how amazing it is. So when G is an abelian group, the amazing fact is that just the structure of the group G already distinguishes crisply and, and uniquely uh, a family of functions that in fact span the entire space CG. So that's what I want to say next. So what's our plan? Our plan is to write f as, um, maybe I won't write it that way, alpha chi times chi. So we want to write f as a linear combination of some functions here that for one reason or another are heavily adapted to the structure of G and make the process of trying to answer questions about G structure really easy. And so what functions uh, are we going to look at? We're going to look at the nicest functions from a group G into the complexes. So let's say that G is abelian. And let's consider the following collection of functions, uh, the homomorphisms from G into C, functions from G into C that respect the G structure. And um, maybe I will just say a few facts about these. So first of all, uh, these functions are um, orthonormal. Of course, these guys lie in CG. And they're orthonormal with respect to the inner product defined. And so that means that these functions form a basis. Oh, um, and there are G of them. So these functions form a basis for CG. So um, in this uh, context, the entire process of Fourier analysis um, can be thought of as the process of taking a function f and writing it as a linear combination of these functions that are distinguished by the, distinguished by the group structure. So one nice fact is that since these functions are orthonormal with respect to this inner product, um, we can sort of explicitly write out how this looks. We can always write f as the sum over all of these functions. of and this number here that crops up in this basis change is what we call the Fourier coefficient. Okay. 
So uh, Shore and uh, Simon were essentially the, the discoverers of these uh, quantum algorithms that can be explored in this poor man's model that I already talked about for solving the hidden subgroup problem over abelian groups. And their strategy, you can now guess in the unlikely event that you don't already know them. Um, so their strategy is to measure in this Fourier basis. And um, I, I'm not going to do the computation, though it's easy. Um, one nice thing that measuring in that basis does is that it very neatly handles the problem of this kind of irritating left multiplication by a random coset. So let me tell you the state that crops up if you do this. Um, uh, so maybe it's time for a new blackboard since I'm now talking again about the quantum algorithms. So sure. And Simon's algorithms. So the good idea is to measure in the Fourier basis. And uh, what happens? Well, uh, what is the function that we're measuring? Maybe for the moment, I'll write it like this. It's f of ch. This is a function which um, on uh, elements in CH and zero other ones. And so what do these Fourier coefficients look like? What is f at chi? It's an easy computation. It turns out that um, these are extremely well structured and um, behave very nicely with respect to this uh, left, uh, left coset element here. It turns out that these are, um, that these are, well, they're a constant, alpha, if h is inside the kernel of chi, and zero otherwise. Um, this constant depends on these other constants that I have um, uh, introduced for the Fourier transform here. And so why is this such a nice fact? It's such a nice fact because notice that this condition here has nothing to do with C. So in particular, if you carry out this measurement process, what you end up with is a distribution So sampling in this basis yields the uniform distribution on this set. Let's call it H perp, the collection of all um, homomorphisms so that H is inside the kernel homomorphism. And um, uh, again, I'll brush these details under the rug. Uh, this uh, actually has group structure, but the point is that with a small number of samples, uh, a number of samples logarithmic in the side of the group, size of the group, you can uh, completely learn this entire set. And having learned this entire set, that allows you to determine H. Yeah, so, okay, so obvious point is a good one. If if you're uh, in the arena of z2 to the n, for example, then this notation really means what you think it means. Okay? You essentially 
um, observe by measurement a random element of the space uh, perpendicular to H. And uh, now, at least, the conceptual structure is clear, right? By making enough samples to that space, they are random samples, you can uh, learn the space, and that allows you to infer the subgroup H. Um, OK, great. So. No, and that's, yes, good question. So that's what this arrow does. In fact, H is the intersection of the kernels of all the elements uh, in, in H perp. Yeah. Okay, so in the abelian case. case, yes. Okay, so now I'd like to switch gears and uh, think about the possibility of algorithms, um, maybe I'll say over, non-abelian groups. Oh, uh, okay, yes, th th that's true. I mean, uh, Shor and Simon's uh, algorithms are better than what I have promised you, right? So, you know, at the beginning of the talk, I said, oh, you can have as much computational time as you want. I'm just going to charge you for queries. But y yes, in fact, both of these algorithms, uh, this one of which originally handled the case Z2 to the N and Shor's algorithm, which handled the order finding case. Um, a little more complicated. Um, both of those algorithms can actually carry out <laughs> that arrow efficiently. Yeah. And uh, for Shor's algorithm, th there's some uh, there's some complications because in some sense you don't know exactly what group you're working in. But you know those are uh, complications you can handle. Um, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is the uh, potential for algorithms of this kind over non-abelian groups. Notice uh, the entire uh, poor man's computing model I described makes perfect sense over, uh, over those groups. And we even have motivation to study this kind of problem over non-abelian groups because, um, is it still there? No. Uh, because of problems like uh, the graph automorphism problem. So that um, is ex exactly a hidden subgroup problem over the group SN. And so so this beckons to us. Right? So can we make the same framework uh, apply over non-abelian groups? And it seems somehow obvious what we need to do. So we had this Fourier analytic uh, framework here that did the hard work for us, right? So once we identified the Fourier basis as the right basis in which to carry out, uh, in which to carry out these, uh, these measurements, uh, as Avi says, in the case of Z2 to the N, it's completely straightforward what happens. And um, uh, in, in, and in Shor's algorithm, you have to do some more work. But you know, again, it's clear the information is there. And so it's somehow it's clear what, ha what should happen next. We need to introduce a satisfactory model of non-abelian Fourier analysis and, and use that to carry out an analogous procedure. So that's what I want to talk about next. So I'd like to introduce just some elements of the theory of non-abelian Fourier analysis. And how are we going to get started? Well, you know, it worked before, right? So we have a function f from g into c. We'd like to understand its structural properties. Uh, we know what to do, right? We want to write f as a linear combination of a family of c-valued functions on g that are somehow delivered to us for free by the structure of the group. Right? This is our goal. So um, the first idea is that we just do what we did before. right? So let's consider HOM G C, collection of all homomorphisms from G into C. And the good news is that um, these are still all um, orthonormal. They're not complete, right? 
The bad news is that there aren't enough of them. Okay. And you know, this would appear to be an absolute showstopper because it, it is completely not clear what to do next to fix this problem. Um, and in fact, it turns out how many of them are there? I mean, there are exactly enough of them to sort of explore the abelian part of the group. That is, you know, the number of these that you have is exactly like the size of G divided by its commutator, you know, largest abelian quotient in the group. So, so you know, the question is what to do next. And it, it turns out what to do next is, is uh, really handsome. So what you do is you broaden your notion of what kinds of uh, homomorphisms are going to uh, command this elite status, right, as the functions that you want to use um, for decomposing f. And what we do is we broaden our notion to a class of functions that are called representations of the group. The images at least allow non-commutativity. OK, right. Uh, this, is another I mean, this is another way of saying we, we shouldn't really have expected this could possibly have worked. In fact, um, you know, by this logic, indeed, the most we could have hoped for is some kind of Fourier analysis here that you know, really just exposed the abelian part of the group structure. Great. Um, so what's a representation? So a representation of a group is also a homomorphism. It's a homomorphism of the, the group G into the collection of n by n matrices over C. And um, I have to be clear what I'm talking about here. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's call them D by D. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so a representation of a group is a homomorphism from G into the, the multiplicative group okay, of all D by D matrices over C. Uh, to remind us that the structure that I'm interested in on the right-hand side here is the multiplicative group, um, we can also write this as, say, the general linear group over some vector space V that you can think of as some C to the D. Okay. This is a homomorphism. Okay. So, the first thing to observe is at least um, if we shift our attention to this notion of a group representation, I mean, at least we recover the old stuff that we had, right? At least we recover these guys, because these guys are just homomorphisms of G into the collection of the, the multiplicative group of one by one matrices. Okay, so so far so good. We get the stuff we had before. And um, what we're going to see is that is that these objects are actually rich enough to develop a completely satisfactory theory of uh, Fourier analysis, um, a Fourier analysis over G. So, so it's not so clear what the inner products are, right? That's right. Okay. However, um, uh, however, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I will. I'm not sure I'm going to say the answer, answer to your question. So your question is a great answer, and in fact, the Fourier transform that one defines, it really is unitary in a in both a precise but in a natural sense. So, but you're right, you have to be careful what you mean by, uh, I mean, okay, so it's not even clear how you, like, put all these things together to even make a space of functions. I mean, at this point, everything is unclear, right? Okay, so, um, so these are going to be the objects out of which we build our Fourier analysis. Um, okay, since I'm not lecturing quickly enough, um, I'll just give you one example of a non-trivial representation. So one example I'm going to give is what's called the regular <coughs> representation. So the regular representation of a group G um, is a representation of G by order of G by order of G dimensional matrices. You can guess what they are, right? They are the permutation matrices that are associated with left action by the group element. Okay. So this is the representation that maps G into, um, and what goes here is actually CG, right? It's the collection of all um, complex valued functions in the group. And, and what does this representation do? If I apply it to a group element G, 
it takes h to g h. So this is a g, this is a representation um, on a g dimensional space. I suppose I didn't say this. Uh, this. This definition here is vague about what d you take. Right? So you know, a, the notion of a representation doesn't specify in advance um, the size of the matrices that you use. And that number d that's associated with a particular representation we call the dimension of the representation, or the degree of the representation. OK, great. So uh, this, looks, I mean, this looks like a nice place to look for these distinguished functions. However, let me point out, this, at this point, it's clear that this, that this theory has to be somewhat more complicated than the theory that we developed 10 minutes ago for abelian groups. Why? Well, I mean, first of all, the class of objects that I have written down here is clearly an infinite class of objects. And so we need some way to pluck out of that infinite class of objects the ones that are going to play the, the, the critical role in our theory. And let me point out that there are sort of two obvious degrees of freedom that you have when you look at representations. One is if, you know, if someone gives me a homomorphism of a group into a collection of d by d matrices, right, you can think about this as like realizing the group, the group multiplication law in terms of multiplication of d by d matrices. Um, if someone gives me a, a representation like that, I can always come up with another representation just by changing the, ba the basis in which those matrices are written, right? So this is like a totally uninteresting change, but I mean, Formally, at least, this can give a different representation. Let me point out that there's another kind of uninteresting degree of freedom here. And the other uninteresting degree of freedom is the following one. So if I have two representations, if rho is a representation, and sigma is a representation, then in a completely trivial way, I can build another representation just by suturing these things together, right? So I can build a new representation, let's call it rho direct sum sigma. And if I take rho direct sum sigma and I evaluate it at a group element g, I, I just patch together the two representations that I already had, right? I put rho of g up here and sigma of g down here. And you know, clearly, this is going to um, behave as a representation. Right? All, the, you know, the, all the action just happens blockwise here. So the good news is that it turns out that these two degrees of freedom are the only ones you need to get rid of. Okay? Once you press away these two degrees of freedom, you end up with a family of atomic objects. Okay? They're called irreducible representations. And those irreducible representations can precisely serve as uh, the family of Fourier basis functions for a theory of Fourier analysis. Um, so let me just, I'll give a definition of how you <coughs> arrive at those uh, atomic objects. So let's consider a representation rho. So we say that a subspace W of V is invariant if it's fixed by every one of these linear operators. Okay, fixed is the whole space, right? Inside the space, things can be twisted around, but um, if it's fixed, we're all G. And notice, in some sense, that's our complaint about this representation, right? Which is that this representation is not atomic. There's this subspace here, which is clearly doing its own thing. And so what you might hope is that you can, um, if you take a representation like this and you find an invariant subspace and throw everything else out and you kind of continue this process, you get to objects that are irreducible under this, uh, under this uh, process of reduction. And indeed, uh, that happens. So we say that rho is irreducible if um, there are no fixed, no invariant spaces.
I guess I should say, except for zero and the whole space, which of course are always invariant. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so let's then define g hat. This is going to be a uh, collection of all representations rho that are irreducible. And, and actually, I'm going to slightly cheat you here. I'm going to call two representations the same if they're the same up to a change of basis. Okay. So this is um, a collection of all, a, a collection of irreducible representations that contains exactly one from each equivalence class uh, up, to, up to isomorphism. Um, by, by basis change. And uh, I'm, not gonna I'm, not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna tell you how you prove the structural properties of the set. If you don't know this theory though, I, um, I would like to say that um, it's not a big deal to establish that this set has the basic structural properties that you need for Fourier analysis. I'll say what some of them are, just so you have some, uh, so we can put Chris's uh, part of the talk into context. But um, the theory, uh, as of, uh, you know, as of the year 2000 has really been distilled down to its basic elements. You can read through very lean and handsome accounts of it. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. So I don't want to use that word too often, but I, I completely agree. So, I mean, it's one of the gems of 19th century mathematics. And so if you don't know it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a religious experience to really understand it, but it's, but it's not that hard, yeah. It, well, um, okay, let me, I'll, uh, I'll, maybe I'll answer that more faithfully in a minute. Okay, so uh, what do I mean that it works to build a theory out of these? So first of all, let's just sort of check that the number of degrees of freedom is right, okay? So notice that if I have a representation rho, then one way to think of this is as a collection of uh, D functions from the group into the complexes. Right? So then, you know, if I look at rho of g in a particular, oh, uh, yeah, if I, if I, in a particular basis, I get all these entries of this matrix, and so there are d squared <coughs> coordinate functions here from g into c. And when I say that the uh, number of degrees of freedom works out, what I mean is that if you sum d squared over all of the irreducible representations that we have you know, explored here, you get exactly um, the order of the group. Okay? So you have exactly the right number of degrees of freedom. And under the right notion of uh, inner product, which I'm going to cheat you, um, these are actually uh, uh, orthonormal functions. Okay? So, Then sum for all rho g hat of the dimension of rho squared is exactly the size of the group. So there are enough of them and it's a fact that they are orthonormal. So, just so that Chris doesn't have to do this. Let me just write down a notion of Fourier transform and Fourier inversion, so at least you can see what these formulas look like. So, the Fourier transform of a function f from g to C associates F with a family of coefficients. And of course, um, if you like, you can treat each one of these uh, coordinate functions as an individual function here and kind of take an inner product. Um, as I write down the Fourier transform here, you're going to see that it looks like taking an inner product of F with this entire matrix. That is, it kind of groups all of these d squared functions together at the same time. 
and there's a reason to do that. Um, so this associates with f a bunch of Fourier coefficients, one for each representation row, and this is uh, f of g, row of g. You'll notice I'm using a slightly different convention from the one I used in the abelian case, but um, uh, don't let that bother you. And we, so we have one of these. We have one for each row in g hat. And then what is the Fourier inversion rule? That is, how do I recover f from this uh, family of Fourier coefficients? And let me emphasize that these Fourier coefficients, as I have defined them here, are matrices, right? So, you know, this is a weighted combination of these uh, d by d matrices that you get from the here. Or a linear operator would be a nicer way to think of it. And um, with, this, with this notion of Fourier transform, the Fourier inversion rule says that f of x is the 1 over g there. So sum over all rho um, of the dimension rho times, turns out what you get here is the trace of f hat rho, uh, rho of x inverse. Okay. And, okay, this is not so strange, but I, maybe, I won't, maybe I won't say more about it. Um, so hopefully this gives you a picture of what the Fourier transform looks like. Right? It associates with f. Uh, one linear operator for every representation row, and based on that family of linear operators, you can then recover. Uh, you can recover the elements of f. Um, so why is the x Yeah. Okay. All the dimensions are one. Yep. Right. As I wrote it before, I guess I took. It would have been a star up here. So good. So in the abelian case, all the representations, uh, all, of the irreducibility, all the irreducible representations have dimension one. And then, uh, as Avi says, you exactly recover the, um, the previous inversion rule. There was some other question. Uh, what's yeah. the x inverse? The that's, the, that's, that, that's the conjugate part. Um, it, to be a little careful, yeah, that's, that's just the conjugate part. Okay. And it turns out that's the right way to do this. Um, it's, and it's natural, but you'd have to check that it's doing the right thing. Okay, so there's one last thing I would like to say because this will be relevant for um, what Chris talks about, which is that um, when representation theorists study the, the representation of finite groups or Lie groups, other thing, one problem is that it's often not so clear how to find or construct these representations. Okay, so in general, it's a it's a hard problem to take sort of an arbitrarily structured group and identify all these representations. On the one hand, these are complicated objects, right? These, you know, linear transformations on a d-dimensional space. Um, and so one technique that, um, that the representation theory commu community uses to try to um, discover new representations, let's say, about a group G, is to explore something called the Klebsch-Gordon rule. Um, well, maybe I won't even call that. Let's just talk, talk about it as tensor products of representations. And to warm up to this, let me just say one word about reduction. So I didn't develop this in this you know, high speed development of the theory that I have discussed so far. I, I did give you an example of a situation where you have a representation that is really the sort of, you know, uh, hidden stitching together of two simpler representations, okay? And I gave this representation this mnemonic name, right? Rho tensor sigma. And uh, rho o plus sigma, yeah, thanks. And it is in general a fact that any representation can be expressed as a direct sum of irreducible representations. Okay. 
So for any representation rho, you can always write it as, let's write it like this, as a direct sum of a bunch of irreducible pieces. You may need a basis, you may need a basis change to, to do this uh, so that it looks like that. Where these are irreducible. And I, it's just it's worth understanding, you know, that even the same piece could appear many times in here, right? So it could be here that, you know, rho is equal to sigma. Um, so uh, there's this general process of reduction. Uh, any representation in question can be written as a direct sum of irreducible pieces. And uh, the one last operation I would like to describe is the following. So with two representations, let's say rho. sigma, we can always define a new representation, which is the tensor product of these two representations, in the natural way. So this is a representation that operates on V tensor W. And uh, the action is given by the tensor product of the two linear operations. So rho tensor sigma of g is what it looks like. So rho g tensor sigma of g. And you know, the regular functorial properties of tensor product means that this, is, this, this works. It's still a representation. Um, so why is this interesting? So uh, this is interesting uh, because it crops, a lot, it crops up a lot in nature. But it's also interesting for the following reason. It turns out that if you take two irreducible representations, rho and sigma, in general, this representation will not be irreducible. Okay. So the Klebsch-Gordon problem um, is the following. It's the problem of taking two typically irreducible representations, because if you can answer the questions for those, it turns out you can answer it for arbitrary representations. Um, the Klebsch-Gordon problem is the problem of taking the tensor product of two irreducible representations and determining what their irreducible constituents are. Let me just one, two, and this. Good. So this will crop up in Chris's talk. Okay, so um, hopefully the pace of this was about right. Uh, now I'm going to hand the chalk to Chris, who's going to give you the good stuff. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, do we know anything about the time complexity of finding the irreducible representation for the um, Yeah, that, that's a good question. So people have studied the problem. I mean, so I, I guess, again, it depends a lot on what the model is. So. Um, you can ask, like, if I give you the group as a multiplication table, a G by G multiplication table, um, and I think there's a paper of. Okay, yeah. So there's. A, it, 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 so you're given the multiplication table. Yeah. Then you can construct an opponent. Yeah. No, it's, it's non-trivial. No, you have to work. You have to work to do it. Um, okay. Great. The, if you're talking with your friends in the uh, physics department, the Klebsch-Gordon problem is all, they, they call it adding angular momenta. So if you have two elementary particles, then the joint system is the tensor product. 
and then the various elementary particles they can fall apart into are the, uh, are the irreducible constituents. D d don't, erase f d don't erase everything. <laughs> um, so, so uh, well, okay. So, um, with apologies to you and to Alex, I'm going to use some slightly different normalizations um, because uh, I want everything to be unitary and in, uh, in kind of the, I, so I, I'm not going to put that factor of one over G. And so in particular, um, I'll define the coset state with uh, like this. And um, Let's see if you if you don't mind, Alex. Um, rather than having one over g in one direction and d rho in the other, I'm going to have square root d rho over g in both directions. Okay, but I won't I won't need this, so don't worry about it. Um, all right, so. So just to amplify what Alex was saying about graph isomorphism and graph automorphism, I think it's fair to say that in the years sort of immediately following 1994 when Shore discovered the factoring algorithm, um, a lot of people were hopeful that graph isomorphism might be the next to fall, right? So it's, you know, we don't know a polynomial time algorithm, although we do in kind of nearly any special case you can think of planar, bounded degree, bounded eigenvalue, minor closed, um, which generalizes planar. Um, well, but there's still like one nice case that's strongly regular that I think is not. Uh, yes, we don't, yeah, although interestingly, uh, so Spielman has a, a, a nice algorithm which is a little bit better for strongly yeah, regular yeah, that yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we still don't have a polynomial time algorithm. I don't think our belief that it's outside P is particularly strong. Um, we don't expect it to be NP complete because it has interactive proofs and so on. Um, so, but, uh, so like factoring at the moment, it's in this limbo in between P and NP completeness. And so there was a hope that maybe there'd be a quantum algorithm for this. And um, so how does it work? I show you two graphs. Uh, uh, zing. For instance, these two. And I ask you if they're isomorphic. And um, so how do I reduce this to the graph automorphism question? Uh, yeah, I know you're all working on that. Good, good. Um, so I, I take their disjoint union and I place them side by side. And if each one had n vertices, I form a graph with two n vertices. And then I just ask, what are the automorphisms of this entire graph? If they are isomorphic, then in addition to whatever internal automorphisms they have, there's also at least one automorphism that switches the two. Um, and so I want you to focus on the case, which is not this case because this case is so pretty, um, where both graphs are rigid, where they have no internal automorphisms. So I'm going to, you know, put a bunch of bells and whistles on the uh, vertices here so that there are no internal automorphisms. And the question is just then, um, either there is an automorphism of this joint graph that swaps the two and maps the vertices on each side to the corresponding vertices on the other side, or there isn't. And there's only one just the trivial automorphism of this graph, do nothing. So, yeah. Wait, so don't the widgets seem to be distinct on different vertices? Yeah, yeah, but I didn't want to draw too many of them. But then, but then like, don't you need to put the same widget on the ice vertices on the two sides? Like, how would you do Yes, I, yes. Well, so, um, there's, a, there's a Turing reduction to the rigid case. Right, by, by adding a bunch of bells and whistles. I just like these two graphs. I didn't want to draw rigid graphs. But let's yeah, focus on the rigid case for now. Yeah. So um, 
Right, so if G is this, the disjoint union of these two things, then in the rigid case, either the automorphism of G is this, or it's this for a single involution, right? A period two permutation that switches the corresponding vertices, okay? We're just trying to figure out which of these two cases it is, all right? So um, I don't need to worry about the, you know, more general automorphism groups. So, um, so as Alex said, how would we uh, apply a quantum algorithm to this? Um, and as Avi made us say, you start out with a random superposition, uh, a, a uniform superposition of all possible permutations, right? So what is the function here? So I, I, let's say that G has N vertices, so I don't have to write uh, two N. So each one of these has N over two vertices. And then I have a function um, from Sn to the set of all graphs, um, which I will abusingly write uh, curly bracket G. And what does this function do? Um, if I have a permutation of these n vertices, it just gives me the permuted graph. Okay. Sure, sure, yeah. I, I, yes, I, how do I email you this? I email you the adjacency matrix, and then you permute the rows and columns. Um, okay, so again, if there are no automorphisms of this joint graph, if the two graphs are rigid and not isomorphic to each other, this function is one-to-one. -one. You know, each, each scrambling I do gets me a, a different image, um, but if they are isomorphic, it's two-to-one. There's exactly one thing I can do that gives me the same picture as I had before. And I'm just trying to figure out the difference between those two cases, whether this function is one to one or two to one. That's all I ask. All right, so when we prepare uh, this coset state, we generate this uniform superposition, and then we measure the graph or its adjacency matrix. And then, as Alex was saying, ironically, you know, we, we, we measure the, the function's value and then throw it away. <laughs> because all we care about are these symmetries. And so then I either get a state which is this. So this is a random coset of the trivial subgroup. It's just a single group element. Or I get a superposition of two group elements where this is this involution, this swap that I'm trying to discover. And all I want you to do is tell me which one of these I have, or if we work in a promise where it's this one where I tell you they are isomorphic, I want you to find mu. I want you to find the isomorphism. And that's all I ask. Doesn't seem like much. Surely these two types of states are very different from each other. All right, so um, I want to tell you a few facts about the um, the representation theory of the symmetric group in particular. What if there are other isomorphisms? Well, then presumably, it don't, then presumably it gets easier if there are more isomorphisms. But, but state becomes, uh, uh, exactly. I mean, the number of different things in here is the size of whatever the subgroup is, whatever the automorphism group is. But for simplicity, we'll focus on the case where it's either one or two. All right. So, um, if you're like me and you learn things primarily through examples, then it'll be good to think about S3, the smallest non-abelian group. It has six elements. And let's just describe all of its representations. So one representation, which is there for any group, is the trivial representation. It sends every group element to the number one. It has dimension one. It's frequency zero, if you like. Well, as you all know, the other uh, one-dimensional representation of the permutation group is parity. So it sends us to plus or minus one depending on whether the permutation is even or odd. Well, for the, for the symmetric group, these are the only two. And so, as Alex was saying, if we want, uh, if we want to do harmonic analysis, we need a basis. Um, 
for the six-dimensional space of, uh, of complex-valued functions. So we need one more representation, and this dimension is two. And you know what it is. I, I'm going to call it rho. And you know, what's a representation? It's a, it's a realization of the group if, if we focus on you know, things that are, uh, say, unitary matrices or orthogonal matrices. It's a representation of the group as the rotations and reflections of some d-dimensional space. So what you do is you place three points at, an, uh, at the corners of an equilateral triangle. And by rotating this and reflecting around various lines, you can clearly carry out any permutation of these three things. In fact, this generalizes to higher dimensions. Sn has an n minus one dimensional representation where you permute the corners of, a, of an n simplex. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a good exercise to write, this, to write these things down. So for instance, if my axes are like this, so if I actually choose a basis, and this is one, two, and three, then, for instance, rho of the transposition of 1 and 2 um, is just the reflection around the x-axis. And rho of the rotation 1, 2, and 3 is just the uh, rotation, and these signs are either right or they're not, um, the rotation by 2 thirds pi. It is then a good exercise to make a table of six six-dimensional vectors, one, 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 or however many that was, the parity, and then uh, this, the upper left-hand corner for all six elements, the upper right-hand corner, and then check that if we normalize them um, with this normalization factor, square root of the dimension divided by the size of the group, that these six vectors are orthonormal. Okay, so even if you've learned this in the abstract, I really encourage you to, you know, next time you're at a bar, you know, just do this on a napkin and work it all out. It's nice. Now, as Alec was saying, our choice of basis here is quite arbitrary. There are lots of other bases that we could have written these uh, two-dimensional linear operators in, um, and but so that's that's a choice that in our setting the algorithm designer has. All right, so um, now, as many of you know, there's a lovely combinatorial description of the representations of Sn in general, which is that each irreducible representation is associated with a Young diagram, or if you wish, a partition, of consisting of n boxes. The trivial representation is this one. It's all horizontal. The parity representation, which is there for any n, is always that, the vertical Young diagram. And so here's the one other one, and that corresponds to the two-dimensional representation of S3. And there is a lovely formula called the hook length formula for, uh, for the dimension of one of these representations. So if I have some Young diagram lambda, then the dimension of the corresponding representation. Yes, it's an arrangement of n boxes where each row is less than or equal to, has width less than or equal to that of the row above it. Okay. Um, so the hook length formula for the dimension is n factorial divided by the product over all boxes of the hook of that box. And what does that mean? Well, each box has some stuff to its right and below it in a line. So the hook of this box would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one would also be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You take the product of all of those and divide n factorial by that, you get the dimension. Um, so for instance, here I have 3 factorial divided by 1 times 1 times 3, and that is 2. Um, the, uh, I should mention that this is also, so 
this dimension is also the number of young tableau. And what is a young tableau without an x? Since that's the singular. It is a way of filling in a young diagram with the numbers one through n so that each row and each column is increasing. So another way to see that this is a two no, I'm filling in with one, each number appears once, yeah. So this has two young tableau, which is the other way to see that it is two-dimensional. Now, there's a beautiful theory of what, hasm, uh, what happens asymptotically in Sn as n gets large. And it's a, a theory that we were able to uh, use in some of this work. So on one of these boards, so remember Alex wrote, because these, because these things form a basis, the sum of the squares of the dimensions is the size of the group. Well, if I divide both sides by the size of the group, I get a very natural looking probability distribution on all the IREPs. IREP is short for irreducible representation. This is called the Plancherel distribution. Um, and this is literally the fraction of the regular representation. It's the fraction of CG consisting of, uh, the, the, the fraction by dimension consisting of spaces that when you apply G are transformed by rho, okay? And uh, there are, if you're wondering why this is squared, well, it's really because the regular representation you can think of it as, um, and I, I don't want to confuse you, but uh, if you divide it up, then, well, this much of it, <laughs> d rho squared, consists of copies of d rho. What do I mean? Copies of rho. What do I mean by a copy of rho? Well, if I imagine rho multiplying things on the left, then each of these columns is gets independently modified by left multiplication by rho of g whenever I multiply by g. And so I have d rho copies of rho. Each one is d rho dimensional. That's why it's squared. So the transform to the question about the inner product, you just have added this normalization factor when you're doing that product. Yes, this is the source, if you will, of this factor of d rho. All right. All right. So, so a question which should be burning in your mind right now is if I select a representation of Sn according to this Plancherel distribution and I look at what Young diagram it corresponds to, what distribution do I see on those Young diagrams? So put, to put it differently, I, uh, I choose from all of these Young diagrams with probability proportional to the square of the number of young tableau they have, what happens? Well, what happens is that typically you get a beautiful asymptotic shape, which is known analytically. And um, typically, the top row has a uh, width about two root n. And this is also related to this wonderful Ulam problem and uh, never mind. It's just gorgeous. Lots of wonderful combinatorics here. Um, Are you describing the typical one or some way to average? The th they're, really, they're really concentrated around here. So you get like Gaussian fluctuations around this. Okay. So, um, and this is work of people like Kirov and Vrishik. And so, but the other nice fact is that most of these, where by most I mean when chosen according to this distribution, have extremely high dimension. So the typical dimension is about the square root of the size of the entire group, which is the biggest it could possibly be, times a factor which is exponential in root n. And if you want to know why this is natural, if you wish, it's because the total number of different Young diagrams is, also, is often known as the partition number. And that is exponential in, 
in root n. Okay. So this is roughly what you would get if you just you know, divided the square root of the size of the group by the number of different partitions. All right, there's one other fact I want you to know and one other piece of terminology I need to introduce, uh, which I, uh, you didn't mention characters when I was out of the room, did you? Okay, so there is a, um, a nice kind of summary of a representation, which is its trace. And in fact, uh, chronologically, these things were discovered first before people really understood that these were matrices. And this is called the character. We'll sometimes write it like that. Um, so for instance, uh, if I look at a representation at the identity, well, this is, of course, the identity matrix, because that's where the homo uh, any homomorphism has to send the identity. And so this is the dimension. And so we will often think about the a normalized version of the character, which is Cairo divided by the dimension. So this is one if the group element is the identity. If it's far from the identity in some sense, you might imagine that it's quite small. And indeed, there is a bound due to Reichmann, although there are now stronger bounds uh, due to our friend Piotr Snyadi and his collaborators, um, that in most representations, in typical representations, the normalized character of a permutation is typically very small, in particular if the permutation has uh, full support. So let's define the support of a, of a permutation pi um, as the number of uh, things that get moved by the permutation. So for instance, for our involution here, the support is n, it's everything. And so then let's say that if I have a Young diagram, um, I will, uh, you know, sometimes people write lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 for the width of the rows. So lambda 1 is the width of the top row, which is the longest one. And then lambda prime 1 will be the height of the leftmost column, which is the tallest one. So Reuchmann says that the normalized character of a permutation at a representation of the symmetric group in absolute value is less than or equal to the maximum of some universal constant, okay, which is independent of n and everything else. And then the width divided by n or the column divided by n, all of this raised to the support. So the upshot of all this, and the only thing we're going to use about it, is that this is exponentially small um, unless this is very close to 1 or this is very close to 1. Okay? So for us, this is n. And so unless you are extremely close to the trivial representation, in other words, you have almost n things here and just a few hanging out, or extremely close to the parity representation, this normalized character is exponentially small. And we will use that fact. All right, so I think I have all the machinery here. Um, one thing I should mention is, not only is this true of a typical representation, but a very simple union bound shows that if you select a representation according to the Plancharel distribution, its dimension is almost always of this order with some fixed constant there. Okay, so almost always you see these huge representations with these big Young diagrams. Is there a better way to handle something like this? Uh, with a quantum computer. <laughs> but yes, also uh, classically, with, you can do it poly in polynomial time in N. So, you know, there's this, uh, there's this robinson shenstead knuth game where you can produce, uh, I mean, yes. Also quantum by transition measure. Sorry? Uh, yes, yeah, you can, 
there is a, kind, there is a lattice of uh, representations called the Bertelli diagram where you add one block at a time um, and climb up through the representations of S1, S2, and so on. All righty. So <laughs> now that our machinery is all in place, um, by the way, I, you know, I, I think Alex was absolutely right to not go into these issues, but the whole question of whether you can carry out the uh, Fourier transform efficiently is a very interesting and beautiful one. So, you know, for the cyclic group, there, you know, part of Shor's algorithm relied on this quantum circuit with a polynomial, polynomial in log n number of gates, which is isomorphic in some sense to the fast Fourier transform. Um, and for the symmetric group, things are more complicated, but you can basically quantize these classical fast Fourier transforms that people have invented for non-abelian groups as well. So whenever there's, the group has a nice enough structure, you can carry out the quantum Fourier transform efficiently. Yeah, it's huge. Although we don't know how to do that in a totally generic way, but it, for, for most group families we've looked at, yeah. Um, yeah, so Beals did the fast, the, the quantum Fourier transform for the symmetric group, and then we learned a lot more about this from our friend Dan Rockmore and wrote it down for a bunch of families. But the convention is that it's possible for every group? And well, I don't know about for every group, but so for... And indeed, um, one thing that you can do generically is if you obtain a quantum one, you can always get a classical one at the cost of a factor of g. So right now, any improvement in our best quantum Fourier transform for SL2P would, uh, would imply uh, a new improvement for the classical FFT. That would be great, yeah. All right, so, um, so returning to this, let's, you know, I have this state. And one thing I want to describe, I, I just want to point out that if these two graphs are not isomorphic, so that the hidden subgroup is the trivial subgroup, um, if we measure in the Fourier basis, what do we see? So, um, I'm going to throw away my old use of F and replace it with a new use of F. Sorry, I just want to call it F. Um, so, you know, in this case, I would have uh, a, a superposition, which is just, well, a state, which is just a single basis vector. F of X is 1 if X equals C and 0 if it isn't. Um, so this is in one of the uh, notations that you saw earlier. So this is the amplitude of an element x. So let's suppose that that's the state. Um, well, what's the Fourier transform of a delta function? Well, you know what the Fourier transform of a delta function is. It's uniform. What does uniform mean here? Well, you know what that ought to be. Um, let's just go through it. So f hat of rho would be square root of d rho over g times rho of c. Okay, so again, this is this 
matrix valued Fourier coefficient. Now, um, in the history of this problem, people started out by doing what they called a weak measurement, which is, isn't a term we, you know, it'll, it'll fade into history, but it just means, ju what if I just measure which irrep I'm in? Okay, so each irrep is a part of the space. I'm not gonna measure sort of which row or column I'm in, just the name, as people say, of the irrep. Well, the total probability of observing rho is the sum of the squares of all the matrix elements here. It's the length, of the length squared of that vector, but that's just the Frobenius norm. Um, ah, but uh, we can also write that as the trace of rho dagger times rho. Um, but, you know, rho is unitary, so this is just the identity, and so we get this. So we get exactly the Plancherelle distribution. All right, so if the two graphs are not isomorphic, when we observe the representation, we see precisely the Plancherelle distribution. Do you think it would make sense to say, without proof, that um, we know that the most informative basis measurement to do is the one that's right to one? That's true. So I, I, I will not prove this. But in fact, um, yeah, you might, you might think, oh, well, these guys are just really in love with this Fourier stuff, and they're only analyzing that family of bases. In fact, you can show that any measurement that would, that would give you, th the, the optimal measurement on the coset state is consistent with first measuring which irrep you are in and then doing a measurement inside the vector space corresponding to that irrep. I won't prove that. If you demand a proof, I will present one or at least throw some quantum terminology at you about density matrices. <laughs> but it's true. All right. So, um, so now let's look at the other case where my state, again, is an equal superposition of two things, a random element and that random element times our transposition so that f of x is 1 over root 2 if x is c or c mu and 0 otherwise. Um, well, now, what's my Fourier transform? Again, applying that formula, it's just this. Now, um, let's start by figuring out what's the probability I would observe rho in this case. What's the Frobenius norm of this Fourier coefficient? Well, there's a very nice thing we can notice here. One thing we can do is pull rho of c out in front. And, you know, by the way, if you're, if you're already a bit confused about, wait, are, are these vectors or are they matrices, I, I sympathize. So this is a vector, but it's living in the vector space of d rho dimensional matrices. Um, so I can pull rho of c out. And then I can uh, write this row of 1, also known as the identity, plus row of mu. And now I want to point out that this is a projection operator, right? Why is that? It's because mu squared is 1. So in other words, you know, I have a subgroup here of order 2. And if I were to square this op, I mean, what does this say? It says multiply by a random element of the subgroup. If you do that twice, you get multiply by a random element of the subgroup, right? Since the subgroup is closed under multiplication. So this is a projection operator. And I will call it pi of h. It's a lovely fact that if you take any representation and average it over any subgroup, you get a projection operator. All right, so now what is the probability of observing rho? Well, this is unitary, so multiplying by unitary operator doesn't change the Frobenius norm of the matrix. So then I get 2 d rho, I get this normalization, times the Frobenius norm of this, but this is a projection operator. The Frobenius norm is the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues. But that's the same as the sum of the eigenvalues because they're all zero or one. 
So this is also the trace, which is also the rank. All right, so well, let's work out the trace. So uh, this is 1 half times the trace of row 1 plus the trace of row mu. But that's the average of these two characters. OK. So putting all this together, um, what do I get? The twos cancel, and I'm going to pull out another D row and put it there to make it look like the Plancharel distribution. And then here I get chi row over D row at the identity, but that's one. And here I get the normalized character of our involution. And that's really small almost all the time, OK? So we've already learned something, which was in a, a nice early paper on this subject by uh, Sean Hallgren and Alex and uh, Amnon Tashma, which is that measuring the name of the representation is not going to help us solve this problem because for almost all representations, this normalized character is exponentially small. And so the probability distribution I get on representations is exponentially close to the Plancharel distribution. And so it would take me an exponential number of measurements of coset states to tell uh, whether the two graphs are isomorphic or not. OK? All right. So this is already kind of a blow. I mean, I guess you know, in, in a trivial sense, in the abelian case, since all the representations are one-dimensional, Measuring them is the same as measuring their name. So, you know. But of course, this isn't, you know, we're not dead yet. So then people moved on to what they called strong measurement, where you first you measure the name of a representation, and then within there, the algorithm designer may choose any basis she desires, regard as Alex said, will will throw computational complexity to the winds. Um, and what, what can we learn from any basis within rho after we're in rho? Um, so, and with that, I will, I, I will finish up by showing you that that doesn't work either. Okay? Sorry, but uh, why is it uh, tempting the Plancharel distribution? Because you see the Plancharel distribution exactly if they're not isomorphic. And if they are isomorphic, you see something, a distribution exponentially close to it. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's choose a basis, any basis you want. For the vector space on which rho lives. OK, so now. You know, I've done what people call a partial measurement. I've learned that I'm in uh, a copy of rho. I'm now going to do a further measurement. I'm going to measure one of the basis vectors. So what's the probability that, uh, that I observe a particular basis vector? Um, well, as Alex said, it's just you, you take the inner product of the state, which here we've already Fourier transformed, and take the absolute value squared of that inner product. So let's just write that out. Here's our Fourier transform again. Um, and here's row of C. And so I'll write it like this. Um, here is our Fourier, tra Fourier transform. And again, there's a little bit of a parsing issue passing back and forth between thinking of things as vectors within a product and thinking of matrices acting on, on each other. 
Um, but it's going to be the case that I'm going to have, th the probability is going to be the length squared of this vector after being hit by this projection. And so then to get the conditional probability, I will divide by P of rho, um, which I will write, uh, sorry, when I square this, this gets squared, I should have said that. And this is rho of c, but again, this is unitary, so that's not going to change the length squared. So we can ignore that. And then on the bottom, to get the conditional probability, I divide by the probability of observing rho in the first place. These cancel, and I get the rank of this projection operator. So this is a nice looking object. It's the length squared of the basis vector I'm interested in after being hit by this projection operator divided by the rank of the projection operator. And so let's write this out. We can write it like this. Okay. All right. So this. It's really close. Um, the, the rank is very close to its dimension over two. Yeah, exactly. It's exponentially close. Its fractional rank is exponentially close to a half. Um, I mean, to put that differently, because we have this involution, right, you know that the eigenvalues of an involution are plus one or minus one almost exactly half of them are plus one and almost exactly half are minus one because the average of all of those gives the normalized character and that's exponentially small. Okay. So here's a probability distribution. Um, the, the question is, is this any different from the uniform distribution? Okay. So notice that if these things were not isomorphic, I would have one over this rank. I, I would have a uniform distribution. Um, and even if I promise you that they're not isomorphic, does this distribution tell you anything about what the isomorphism is? Well, right. All right. So um, what I want to do is focus on the variance of this. Variance with respect to what? Well, I have this involution, but I don't know what it is. Now, I'm going to, for simplicity, imagine that this involution is chosen uniformly from the conjugacy class of all involutions of full support, all permutations that consist of n over 2 swaps of pairs. It's actually not all of those, right? It's only the ones that switch these n over two things with those n over two things. And that just means looking at the wreath product of, blah, blah, of Sn over two with Z2, and it's just slightly more technical and it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So, uh, but there, there's so much more to show you, but I'm really almost done. I know, but aren't we all, aren't we getting hungry? Oh, when I need lunch. All right. Um, everyone else can have a fructose drip. Okay. So here is a nice fact. Suppose I have a conjugacy class. So I have an element X, and I'll write its conjugacy class as the set of all things of the form G inverse XG over a group. Well, what is conjugating due to a matrix? It changes basis, but it preserves its trace. And if I average over all basis changes, what do I get? I get a scalar matrix because I'm looking at an irreducible representation. So these basis changes go every which way as I conjugate by various group elements. So if I take something and average over its conjug conjugacy class, 
of its image in an irreducible representation, what do I get? I get something proportional to the identity matrix, and in order to get the uh, in order to get the trace right, the constant of proportionality is exactly this normalized trace. Okay, so that's very handy. All right. So now I'm going to I'm going to ask I'm going to focus on this quantity here, and let's start by looking at the expectation. Well, pi of h is the average of the identity and uh, and rho of mu. So this is uh, one half times. Well, if I put the identity in there, I just get b inner b, which is one. Uh, but but now I'm imagining choosing it from this entire conjugacy class. Okay, so um, so I can move the expectation in here, and the second term of this projection operator, I get rho of mu times b. But this is just linear in that. I can move the expectation in there. It just becomes uh, uh, that scalar. And so I just get 1 half times 1 plus, again, this uh, normalized character, which is the you know characters are the same for all conjugacy classes, right? Because conjugation preserves the trace. Okay, and that's one. And the probability of observing B was this divided by the rank, but this is also the rank divided by D rho. So the expectation over this conjugacy class of the probability of observing B is this divided by the rank, which is 1 over D rho. So that's good. That's sensible. If I average over all, if I average this probability distribution over all involutions, I get the uniform distribution. Okay. But maybe depending on the involution, in some cases I get this distribution, in some cases I get that distribution, so maybe I can learn something by doing a measurement. And that is the hope which we wish to crush. Except that's not how we started out. We were hoping it would work. All right. um, so what are we going to do? We're going to analyze the variance, and then I will be done. And the nice thing is it's not so hard. Through the magic of representation theory, All right, so I'm going to focus. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, can you can you put it over there? All right. All right. Um, all right. I'll move this back. Okay. So uh, again, I'm just going to focus on this second term and ask, what is the variance of this inner product? What is the variance of how much B gets mapped onto itself when I hit it with an involution? Well, I'm going to upper bound that as the, with, as the second moment. Which might seem optimistic, but it will work. Now I'm going to do a kind of nice linearization trick. What is this? It's this times its conjugate. But I can also write that as B tensored with its conjugate, inner product with rho of mu tensored with its conjugate. And this is one of those tensor product representations Alex told you about. This is rho tensor rho star, 
perfectly nice representation at mu, averaged over all, uh, average over the conjugacy class. If this were irreducible, averaging it over a conjugacy class would give a scalar. It's not irreducible, but it can be written as a direct sum of a bunch of different irreducible representations. And so each of scalar is along the diagonal. And each of these, exactly, it will be block scalar. So each of these will be a scalar um, when I take the expectation over mu, this will be uh, the character in that representation tau. The normalized character times the identity in tau over a bunch of different irreps. And when I put that in here, I get the following expression, that the second moment is equal to the sum over all these irreducibles appearing in there of the normalized character times the norm squared of the part of B tensor B star which lives in tau. Okay, so imagine taking this thing, writing that out as a block diagonal matrix. In that basis, this projects to a certain extent in each block, and in each block, you get that times the identity. All right, now, here's how the rest goes, and I will finish. There are two kinds of taus, typical ones and bad ones. The typical ones have nice fat Young diagrams, and by Reichmann's bound, this is tiny. The bad ones are really wide or really tall, like, you know, we chose width or height more than three quarters times n, so that's enormous. The typical is root n. Um, for them, we have no control of this normalized character, but there are very few of them. Their total dimension is very small because the hook length formula tells you that their dimension is small because the hook of this eats up. Remember, it was n factorial divided by the product of the hooks. These alone eat up most of the n factorial. And so the total L2 mass of B tensor B star that can project into those bad ones, well, I can't quite say that it's small for all B, but if I average this over all B, it has to be small. So what we end up getting is a bound of the following form. Yes, there might be a handful of basis vectors that project a lot, for which B tensor B star projects a lot into these bad representations, but only a handful. Those handful might have a big variance in their probabilities, multiplicatively speaking, as we change the involution. But all the others have a tiny variance they're very close to the uniform distribution. That's eat, that eats up all the probability mass. And so, no matter what basis you choose, no matter what basis the algorithm designer chooses, regardless of its complexity, um, the variation distance away from the uniform distribution is exponentially small. Okay? And that's the proof. And if there's a, I think the take home message here, besides the overall message about graph isomorphism, which I personally think is either easy for classical computers or hard for quantum ones, and I'll pay you a dollar if you can show me that's not, that's not true. Um, but I'm fairly confident that, <laughs> that uh, uh, if you prove anything, you'll, be, you'll prove my, any, anyway. Um, uh, but isn't it nice how we were able to turn a second moment into a first moment. We turned a quadratic thing into a linear thing by doing this Klebsch-Gordon decomposition, by writing tensor products of a pair of representations as an orthogonal direct sum of irreducible representations. And um, that is something that if the better you understand the Klebsch-Gordon rules, the way that you decompose tensor products and irreducibles for a group, the more of that you can do, you can compute higher and higher moments. And I'm not saying it's easy, 
but the nice thing is that uh, we, this, just the second moment, was enough to give us the result that we wanted. Okay, thank you for letting us go a bit over time. So maybe you could answer Shankar's question now about what happens. What was his question? So yeah, what happens if you take k different earns? Oh, yes. Okay, so this this result, which was joint uh, with Leonard Schulman, was in 2005, and then a lot of people got interested in what if you have multiple copies of this uh, coset state, which means the tensor product, and what if you are now able to measure in some entangled basis, not a product basis, but some interesting joint basis. And we were somewhat interested by this because Cooperberg has a sub-exponential algorithm for the hidden subgroup and the dihedral group, the hidden subgroup problem, um, which works by measuring in a certain kind of entangled basis, doing some decomposition, and it's a sort of sieving algorithm. Um, and uh, it's actually similar to a classical algorithm for, um, for uh, subset sum in, the, in, a, in a random case by uh, A.B. Flaxman, and I'm sorry, there's another co-author there. Anyway, so there was also an existence proof by Edinger and Hoyer that there exists an entangled basis that does tell you everything you need. The problem is that it's, you know, this, it's just an existence proof. We, we have no idea how yeah, to. If you can prepare those measurements things? Yeah, we have no idea if you can, if you can uh, carry out the needed basis change efficiently with a quantum circuit. Yeah, but it does, in the model they are talking about with multiple errors, there is a query algorithm that needs to test for the number of queries in row. Right. So, so yeah, so there are the gap between, you know, it really is a complexity theoretic gap at that point. It, it does exist. I mean, th this was an information theoretic proof. What, it, what we showed you today is that no measurement on a single coset can work. Um, so then uh, uh, Sean Halgren and Pranab Sen and, um, help me out, uh, Martin Ruttler and, and, uh, and us worked out, you know, we're able to generalize this showing that at least you need highly entangled measurements. You need a number of measurements. Uh, you, the, the number of copies of the coset state you need is um, log the size of the group, which here is n log n. And now that doesn't maybe sound so bad, but when you think about the fact that the dimensionality of those measurements is really enormous. Well, the point is that we have no idea how to construct those, except you know, literally the only family of successful algorithms that use entangled measurements is Cooperberg sieve. And then we, along with this guy, Piotr Snadi, who is very nice, but we've never met him, um, showed that for graph isomorphism, that sieving approach cannot work better than the best known classical algorithms. So you can imagine our frustration. I mean, here we felt that we, you know, we went to the cathedral and we learned all this representation theory. We thought we would get this wonderful new algorithm and that people would chase us in the street. And instead, what all this beauty seems to do is prove negative results, that, uh, that our algorithmic ideas, at least so far, bounce off it. The, all this beauty and all these bounds end up being upper bounds in what you can learn from these measurements. Um, it's slightly frustrating, not what we hoped for. Um, but it's still a gem of 19th century mathematics, and by God, it's got to be good for something besides proving that you can shuffle cards really quickly. And so uh, let's keep thinking about it. And there, I should mention that there certainly are interesting families of non-abelian groups for which we have found, we and others have found, um, efficient algorithms, just not ones that are related to especially natural problems in computer science like graph isomorphism. Well, if there are enough, then at some point the problem gets easy. I mean, I, I think one. Well, that's a good question. I think um, a, a sort of parameterized problem that we've wanted to work on for a while but haven't gotten around to is suppose I make a promise to you about the automorphism group. I, I tell you it's either trivial 
or it's at least this big, or it has this, some kind of structure, um, then the representation theory would change. And it would be very nice to find a range in which the, uh, you know, the natural classical algorithms don't appear to succeed, but a quantum algorithm would succeed. So I think there, there could well be promised versions of the problem where you would get somewhere. But you should keep in mind that the best classical algorithms are already pretty good. So they do this in general and this for strongly regular graphs. So you already have to get noticeably beyond the really naive approach to beat the best classical algorithms. And I was asking because here the, the, like the thing, the distinguishing from those case, you can distinguish the two distributions by a small t to the minus n. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, uh, yeah, but that's still not beating this. We would have to get it down to exponential in something less than root n. Um, yeah, but you make a good point. I mean, we shouldn't totally abandon the problem if we can't get a polynomial time algorithm. And you know, there's some you know there there's some plane where a, as the number of automorphisms gets bigger, then the running time should come down. The, the probability of success should go up. Yes. Uh, yeah. You can do a lot with your graphs that are given to you. you can <laughs> I, I, I absolutely. And, and, you know, it may be that 10 years from now we'll look back and say, you know, Shor's algorithm was unbelievably special. This idea of taking a very structured function, measuring it, and throwing away their value. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's really kind of a miracle that that works, that all we care about is the periodicity of, of the function. Um, and, you know, so it may be that factoring is essentially, factoring and discrete log are virtually the only problems for which that approach works, and that, yes, and for everything else we care about, we shouldn't shoot ourselves in the foot by forgetting everything we know about the input. It's, uh, it's two to the order root n. Yeah. 